Okay, so uh, I'm Ray Omgren. Uh, I work at National Instruments here in Austin, Texas. And by the way, welcome to Austin, Texas, and another great day of South by Southwest Interactive. Yeah. Yep. So uh, at NI here in Austin, we make uh, the tools and solutions that scientists and engineers use to make sure the things in your life work, whether it's your mobile device or your automobile or even your refrigerator. Dean Kamen's company, DECA, uses our tools ex extensively in some of the great inventions that his company makes, but also, more importantly, in the first robotics program that you'll hear all about. We make the software for LEGO Mindstorms that's used in First LEGO League and the robotic controllers that you'll see just a little bit later this morning. Dean is probably our country's most famous innovator and entrepreneur. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him here this morning. Uh, he's done amazing things, particularly in the area of medical devices, invented the wearable insulin pump, uh, robotic wheelchairs, and the Luke a robotic arm. For his accomplishments, he has received numerous awards and citations, uh, received the National Medal of Technology from President Clinton, the MIT Lemelson Prize. He's in our National Inventors Hall of Fame and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. I think his most in, uh, impactful invention, though, was founding FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. It's literally changing the culture in our communities to celebrate hard work and great achievements in science, technology, engineering, and math the same way our communities celebrate sports and music. It's having a huge impact in the lives of lots of students all over the world to the tune of 300,000 students will be impacted this year alone, and you'll see some of them this morning. Uh, we could not be more proud to be a partner of FIRST at National Instruments. We believe there's nothing that comes close to having the impact that it's having on the lives of the kids in our communities. Uh, we like to share Dean's perspective on that, that you know, FIRST may not be for every kid, just the ones we really, really care about. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dean Kamen. Thank, Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Ray is great. And NI has been a fantastic partner to FIRST. I'm happy to be back. Uh, last time I was here, I was told I couldn't spend the majority of the time talking about FIRST, but we could do a little. This time I was told we could do a little more. That's why I'm back. Uh, IEEE has created a big piece of this whole event, 17 sessions. It's, it's great that an organization that big is really focusing on the next generation of innovators. I have a little problem. Since I'm now free to spend a lot of time on first, but I asked what could I leave out from the last time, and the, air, the answer was nothing. So I'm going to have to run through a lot of stuff. For those of you that were here last time, I'll apologize. Some of it may be old news, but I'll give you an update since I was last year on water, on power, of course on first, on our arm. Uh, and I'm going to start with a very short overview, about three minutes, because it shows some of our early technology, like an iBot and what it can do. And it shows it in a context that's very appropriate to South by Southwest. Uh, it's the only credible news source left in America, Stephen Colbert. And um, it's an old one now. I three or four times worked with Stephen under the condition that every time I go down there and let him make a jackass out of me, he allows us to have at least one simple, clear statement about first, and he's always honored it. And in this particular one, the reason I continue to use it, even though it's an old one, is he goes into one of his rants about science and technology. And while we all think it's very funny here, remember that most humor is funny because deep down we think there's an element of truth in what otherwise should seem ridiculous. And when he plays this role of this, let's say, less than broad-based intellectual, sadly, I think he's unearthing a lot of real fears and real concerns and real perspectives about science and technology in our culture that have to change quickly. And I think South by Southwest has become a hub 
that brings people from media, arts, technology, business together, and maybe uh, we'll have a way bigger impact on fixing our culture than any of those institutions can do separately. So hopefully to start off with something fun and a little historical review, here is, um, here's a source of news. A little louder. My guest tonight is the inventor of the Segway. I'll ask him who would win a cage match, him or Eli Whitney. Please welcome Dean Kamen. Howdy do! Good nice to see you. you. Nice to see you. Now this thing not only uh, can stand up, this thing can not only stand up. Tell, tell the people what I'm in right now. You're in an iBot, which is a device we created to help the disabled community get around and go all the places that we go. This thing is amazing. Not only was I standing up there on two wheels, cruising, could have gone a lot faster if you'd bumped up the, uh, the, the octane on this thing, right? That, that's for sure. And the, is this internal combustion engine? Sorry, it's not. It's pure electric. No. So pollution. you're one of those granola crunchers. <laughs> you put a Hemi in this thing. <laughs> I could do donuts. <laughs> Actually, that's... Um, Those people were trying to push me over there. You saw that high five, and they're trying yep, to push yep, me over. Yeah. Didn't work. No, my guess is they'd get down before you. And then, uh, and then I went right up these steps here. Just, just hauled ass right up those steps. Very impressive. That was incredible. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Had a lot to do with it. Now, uh, you, but, you know, you were an inventor. You invented this. You invented the Segway. Also, the insulin pump. Am I right about that? Yes, I did. Great. Diabetics. Also, the... the the portable uh, dialysis machine, yep. which is, I gotta say, Thank I gotta you. say that's fantastic, Thank you. but you know you're helping Bin Laden there because he goes, you know that, right? Well, I'm not helping him. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I just think you should think about in, when you invent things to help all humanity, if it helps one person we don't want to help, you shouldn't invent it. <laughs> just think, anyway, think about it. Let's talk about the first campaign. What is first? FIRST stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. It's a program we put together to help more kids learn about science and technology and hopefully get enthusiastic about careers in science and technology. Mm -hmm. And does that include creation science? <laughs> well, we teach kids how to be very creative. Oh, okay, good, good. That's a good sign. Yep, That's a do. good sign. We do. Okay, good. Um, okay. Um, the one fear I have about competing in robot technology is, um, I don't know if you've seen this movie, The Terminator, but <laughs> it is a terrifying vision of the future. It's a documentary, I believe. And, uh, and, and humanity <laughs> falls because mankind invents and builds what it can invent and build, and, 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 and it turns around and, and it ends up biting us in the ass. Spe yeah. Speaking of great technology, I understand you're, you're designing something for the, uh, the Pentagon, for the military. You can, you, it's a super jumper, something like that. What, what do you do with it? Actually, we've created a device that will uh, take a soldier uh, from street level to the top of a four or five story building in about one and a half seconds. Wow. Now, let me, now by announcing that on my show, haven't you just encouraged our enemies to build six story buildings? <laughs> Isn't that the case? Well, and know. there'll be no windows on the <laughs> earlier floors. Or they'll just start the first floor six stories up. Well, they could do that, but that'll just be a good technical challenge for us. All right, good luck with that. Dean Thank you Kamen. Very much. Thank you. We'll be right back. So now on to maybe a little more serious stuff. Uh, as I said, I, I have a company now with about 500 technical people, and we make drug delivery systems and stents and hospital equipment of various kinds, home dialysis machines. We're not going to talk about any of that other than maybe this last one to tell you how our water project is doing. But again, I, I have long believed that technology, when properly applied, is the answer to a whole lot of the world's problems. The trouble is the problems keep getting larger and coming faster at a much larger global population, pushing 7 billion, and we are not creating enough innovators and people comfortable and competent with science and technology to stay ahead of these potential catastrophes. And I guess the real reason I'm here today is to help encourage more people, to help us encourage more kids 
to really get passionate about tech. So a slight update on one of those things. When I was here last time, I showed that we had been asked by the Department of Defense to build a technology to give back to some of the incredible people that have literally given up their arms for this country. And uh, I showed a video with a guy wearing that thing. And uh, he had less than 10 hours training and with no direct neural connections. He's controlling this with a set of gyros in a little matchbook size transmitter we put in his shoe. And uh, he's a double amputee and in the second, as I showed last time, the requirement of DARPA was they've got to be able to pick up a grape without crushing it. So they need haptic response and be able to get it all the way to their mouth and eat it. And we did that. But as he was standing here drinking or eating cereal with a spoon, his wife is behind me and says, Dean Chuck hasn't fed himself in 19 years, so either we keep the arm or you keep Chuck. <laughs> now he's going to pick up that grape, not break it, not drop it, and he's going to eat it. So this is where we were a couple of years ago, but that was our Model T. And since then, uh, we now have the new machine, which looks like this. And we've put more than two dozen of them on our soldiers already. <laughs> now I'm going to go from a product that I hope we never need more than a few dozen of to something that a few billion people desperately need. And those of you that I think probably everybody in this room is familiar with the fact that water is a luxury that sadly a couple of billion people can't afford around the world and electricity without which it's pretty hard to be part of a modern world no internet no computers no communications so we at DECA decided we would figure out how to do in the 21st century to water and power what the 20th century did for communications. The Industrial Revolution was built at a time when everything was big and centralized. Power plants, Ma Bell and landlines, mainframe computers, time sharing. And over the last couple of decades, personal computers wiped out the fact that you needed a giant room full of stuff. And cell phones wiped out the concept that you can't communicate unless you have enough infrastructure to put telephone poles and copper wire from tree to tree to tree to building to building. And from your ear to the ear of whoever you're talking to, there'd have to be a complete set of copper. The end of the 20th century was about personalizing and making point of use communication, point of use computing. So I figured around the world, let's figure out how to make something smaller than this box that could make point of use water, turn anything into clean water, and make electricity locally from any fuel, and do it with boxes that are small enough to be deployed anywhere without a lot of infrastructure, but big enough to have a meaningful amount of output. Let's say make enough electricity for a village of 100 people per machine, and water a thousand liters a day in the same way. Again, I showed you this last time. This is a picture taken out of the window of my building in Manchester, New Hampshire during the summer. And uh, this is, this black box is the early version of our water machine. It's a vapor compression distiller. It'll fill 50 of these 20 liter containers per day with literally uh, medical grade water. And this is a Stirling cycle electric generator. Uh, it will make a couple of kilowatts of power, enough to run a bunch of these. And we had, by the time I was here last, d deployed two of these things to two separate villages in Bangladesh. And since it's an external combustion device, it'll run on anything that'll create heat. We ran for six months on a pit full of cow dung that every day the village people would throw cow dung in there. And with nothing 
more sophisticated than the natural decomposition creating methane with moisture in it and carbon monoxide. It's pretty crummy, but we don't care. For six months it ran. I don't have any cows here, so we cheated, and this one's running on propane. But we decided we could build machines of this scale to supply electricity and water to billions of people. We have the technology. Do we have the will? Do we have the resources to get it out there? After I'd gone as far as I could go to make these machines demonstration projects, I needed to get them out there. And again, the last time I was here, I told you we were pretty excited. We had started a relationship with a little company out of Atlanta that has the best global logistics footprint ever made. I've spent 30 years building medical equipment, but all the medical companies I work with, they're great companies. They sell their products in 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 countries all over Europe, North America, Japan. But there are 206 countries on this planet. Most of the people in this room couldn't name 100 of them. And in those places, that's where most of the people that are desperate for water and electricity live. And my medical partners can't get there. But there's one company, pretty much any village in the world, you go to and you find Coca-Cola. I went to Coke and said, you got to help me get these machines out. Basically, uh, it turned into a situation where they said, help us make a next generation machine that can use your medical compounding technology to mix and measure and control drugs to be able to create in real time with high quality all the different beverages they make. So we designed this system for them using these cartridges, reduce the environmental footprint and be able to offer more products, but said if we can do a commercial fair deal with you to make that work, Will you at least give it a shot to help us figure out if you can use your logistics footprint to start putting water machines around the world? They agreed they would. Their one request, you saw that black box. They said, Dean, our biggest request on that black box, make it red. <laughs> we did. By the way, you'll see more about him in a minute, but this is Will I Am. This is the chairman of Coke. Uh, this is at the Olympics. We built models of a much smaller machine than the ones we had been making. This is an actual full-scale model of the water machine, and Coca-Cola announced that they were going to help us do some trials. Last time I was here, I was telling you we were going to do trials. We did them. I have some video that includes actual video of kids in Ghana where we produced 140,000 liters of pure water during trials in five different schools. And I'm going to show you now that with the help of Will I Am, who said, let's spell Coke backwards, and you get Eco Center. And we said, let's take these water machines, along with our Sterling Electric Generation, along with some help from Qualcomm, and maybe put communication and connect these places to the world with a little bit of our electricity. And with the help of Coke, they made a little two-minute video that talked about what we had already done. You'll see real video, then animations of what this eco-center could look like. And then, since we were just about to move into Paraguay but weren't there yet, we just show some actual footage of the delivery going on because this gentleman, the Chairman of Coke, who was very passionate about this global issue, said, Dean, I'd like to make a two-minute video and show it at the annual shareholders meeting of what we've been doing, what we are doing, and point out the story will continue, and we hope to be in more countries this year. So here, by the way, is an actual deployment of those one of those machines before it became red. Once we got support to put them in production, this guy, uh, that would be Bill Gates, uh, came to visit us and said he also wants to help. So we started getting a lot of momentum. This is an animation of what an eco-center can look like. And here's the video they used at their annual shareholders meeting. A little louder, maybe. This is what the village looked like when we got there. And uh, as I said, in five different schools and clinics, uh, 
we started building relationship all again with the logistics support of Coke. That's one of my DECA guys. Those are, those are the early big heavy machines. They weighed almost 800 pounds. The new ones weigh under 300. And again, this was, this was a vision of what an eco center could look like. With our electricity, we could make refrigeration for medical supplies and vaccines, give people internet access. The, the goal is, is put them all over the world. This is where we are going to be this year. And as I said, we couldn't show installations there because I, don't, I couldn't, uh, I don't know why it's doing this. In any event, um, since he showed that at the shareholders meeting, this is much more recently, this you couldn't have seen last time, that is the chairman in South Africa opening up along with Condoleezza Rice and a bunch of people that I think appreciate the power of technology when you deliver it from the bottom up. This is a real version of that eco center in South Africa. Uh, now back to these two things I showed you. That's where we were a few years ago. We showed you how we're doing with the water machine, this one. What about the engine? Just like we had a giant partner in Coke, we now have a partner, NRG. They happen to be down here in Texas, own Reliant. But they're the largest producer of electricity in this country. And they said, let's go build some of these boxes. And last year we started building them. This is a production floor we've now built for NRG to start a similar kind of trials as we're doing with Coca-Cola for power. We're very excited about what that's going to look like and if I'm lucky enough to get back here and grovel and beg for support for first from all of you next year, I hope that I'll be able to show you a video like the Coke video except showing these power systems being deployed in Haiti and a lot of places around the world that need power as well as uh, in this country where we can make much cleaner, more energy efficient electricity available. So that's my day job. Now we're going to talk about FIRST. Again, I hope most of you, how many people here know what FIRST is? We're making progress. It's only been 23 years and I'm sure it's going to be an instant overnight success. But FIRST, which stands for, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. Notice there's no E in it. We're not an education program. While it's easy in this country of ours to always, for every problem, we have found a simple one-liner, somebody to blame. Politicians, business leaders, it's always easy to blame somebody. I think we typically misdiagnose our problems and we look for soundbite solutions. They're always easy, they're always catchy, and they're typically wrong. I don't think we have an education crisis in this country. We've got a lot of great teachers, my mother being one. She reminds me of that quite regularly. We have a lot of great educational institutions in this country. It can't be that we have slipped so far, not, not just behind the rest of the developed world, but even in many cases, if you look at percentages of kids that study math and science, we have slipped very far down the road against potential global competitors, which isn't good for our business. And by slipping that far, I think our economy is at risk, our security is at risk. And there's still a lot of people that think there's simple fixes or people to blame, and I don't think so. You, know, you can tear down the, the wall in one day. You can pass legislation to give people whatever you want. But it takes a generation to educate a generation of kids. And if kids don't start out with a focus and a passion to learn, you can't open up their heads and pour stuff in 
You can't blame the teachers or the parents or industry. So more than 20 years ago, when I noticed that while everybody was saying we have an education problem in this country, I said, gee, we don't have a shortage of world-class athletes in this country. We don't have a shortage of world-class entertainers. We dominate the world in those fields. Why? Well, for one thing, it's part of our culture. And if kids grow up in a free culture where you get the best of what you celebrate, and we celebrate sports, the NBA and the NFL, and we celebrate Hollywood, no wonder kids are good at developing the skill sets so that we'll have great entertainment and great sports. The trouble is, if the balance goes so far to these national pastimes that they become national obsessions, who's going to keep the lights on? Who's going to do all the stuff that in the background we take for granted because we're the richest country in the world? So I decided there's a great model there for getting kids passionate about something. Sports and entertainment. Why don't we turn sports and entertainment into a tool that can be used by the technical community? And again, it's easy to blame the technical community for things. They do it regularly when anything goes wrong. But I thought if we could get to the technical community and say to them, as I said last time I was here, you know, you get an A plus for the fact that you turn on the tap, the water's clean and it's available. You turn on the switch and there's lights. And this country is, I mean, the technical community has been delivering just incredible, stable resources. The planes fly, the communications work. We get an A plus for creating a quality of life and a standard of living that's in every generation dramatically better than the last generation. Go look at your 20-year-old computer or cell phone. Oh, that's right, you didn't have one. But I don't think the tech community should get more than maybe a D in having influence on kids. Now, they can say, oh, that's because we're busy doing the hard work. But as professionals, as parents, as citizens, the technical community has to reach out and be available to kids to show them that science, technology, and engineering is cool and it's fun. If we don't, who are you going to blame for that? All these other industries are fighting for the hearts and minds of these kids. We have to be there. And we have to make it particularly for women and minorities attractive to develop the muscle hanging between their ears. So 23 years ago, using exactly the model of sports, don't do it in school, make it aspirational, make it after school. Get superstars from the world of tech, like all the members of IEEE. Get them to be the mentors and the role models for kids. Again, using the sports model, make it a short and intense season, six weeks. End it not with tests and quizzes and just, you know, no, end it with double elimination tournament, trophies, awards, school bands, cheerleaders. That works. We went from an experiment in 1992, 20 some odd teams showed up in Manchester, New Hampshire to get a kit of parts, a shoebox full of stuff to play on a field that was about 12 feet by 12 feet. Six weeks later, they all flew back to Manchester, New Hampshire to have our final event in a high school gym in the middle of the winter. That's commitment. The next year, we more than doubled to 60 teams. The next year, we more than doubled. And we've been just on a roll. After 23 years now, we have more than 29,000 schools that got involved in this year's competition, 81 countries, 160 universities. They give us $18 million in scholarships. We don't have one event at the end of the season, but at the end of February, first week in March, we start the regionals. This year, there'll be 66 cities holding regionals, eight, nine, 10 per weekend. You have a couple here in Texas. You had one last week in San Antonio. We have 120,000 volunteer mentors working with these kids, cooperating with the schools and the parents, 3,500 corporate sponsors. It's a big deal. But as Ray said, we don't need it in any, every school. We just need it in the schools where you care about the kids. And I've been saying that since year one. 
every kid in this country deserves the opportunity to see what the world of innovation and technology can do for them, what they can do for the world. Since we want to get to questions, I'm going to give you the fastest review, of, at least you think I'm making up those statistics, of the history of FIRST. I can tell you that we haven't asked the government to come in and help run it. They have a habit of putting things into classrooms and making them less attractive, for instance, than the Super Bowl or the after-school activities at schools. But we have asked every president of the United States, you know what, you've got a great bully pulpit. You're part of that culture of ours that celebrates sports and entertainment. You bring the winners of the, every major sporting event to the White House once a year. Why don't you bring the winners of our first event to the White House and let them stand side by side with athletes and entertainers? We've had four presidents since I started, two Republicans, two Democrats. They've all done it and still do it. We've also recently decided we're the best kept secret in the world. Even though we have all these schools, even though we've been at it changing communities, a lot of people have still never heard of us. Why? Because we haven't gotten the full support. We haven't embraced the world of sports and entertainers. Two years ago, right after we did the Super Bowl halftime, Will I Am and the Black Eyed Peas agreed to come do a halftime show at our championship in St. Louis. It didn't get as much television coverage as the Super Bowl, though. So I said, Will, you've got to bring your whole industry. Let's make an annual event starting next year, I told him then, which was last year. We've got to make an award every year. The, actually, what I had said to Will, who had come to the event, and he's fantastic. I, just before he goes out to talk to everybody, I said, now you're going to tell everybody, Will, that you're going to help make science, technology, and engineering cool to kids. And he looked right at me, and he said, Dean, I, I, I can't make technology cool. This could ruin your whole day when you're out. And he said, I can't make it cool. And he kind of smirked a little. He said, that's because you guys are already dead, but I can make it loud. So last year, for the first time, and we'll do it again next month, and you're all invited to our championship. And you should look at our first events and figure out where there's one near you with 66 cities. But last year, he showed up to get the first, what will now be the annual Will I Am Make It Loud Award. And he gave a little interview at the championship, and you'll hear what he says. I've said it for years, but it doesn't matter that I say first isn't about education, it's about culture. We're not a science fair, we're a movement. But when a guy like Will I Am says it, it's more believable. So I'm gonna give you a quick run through, then I'm gonna show you two videos. One I did have the last time I was here when I started getting Hollywood on our side. We need credibility, so I figured I'd go to the voice of God Morgan Freeman, <laughs> and I get him to help describe first, and then I'll show you the video of Will last year, and by the way, in this video, the background music is his song, Hall of Fame. Here's something you should send a tweet soon, thanking him and letting the world know. You listen to the words to Hall of Fame, and it sounds like it ought to be the theme song of first. And at all of our events, the DJs are always pumping the music. And it always gets everybody going, but we ought to have our own song. So I said, Will, you know that Hall of Fame, you can do this, you can do that, you can do anything you want, you can break rocks. I think you meant you can do anything you want, you can build bots. I said, Will, you're not bad, you got it almost right. So I think you ought to redo that song. And you ought to make it the theme song for first. You ought to come and deliver it, maybe with a music video, at the 2014 championship. He agreed. He's going to be there. He's going to do it. So at, among other things, we ought to let the world know it's going to be an exciting new song. You can thank him and his people for it at, I think it's a, at I am Will. Uh, if that's not right, I'll fix it for you later. But. Uh, very quick history, 1992, the president says, yes, I'll bring your winners to the White House. Six weeks later, uh, he did. By the next year, President Clinton is the president, and he, of course, brings the kids to the White House. By 1995, we've outgrown being able to do events in Manchester, so Epcot says, we'll host you. Seven years later, they can't build a temporary arena big enough, only 20,000 people there. 
So we moved to the Astrodome here in Texas, in Houston. By then, the robots weighed almost 100 pounds, or 80-something pounds. Four years later, we moved to the home of the 1996 Olympics. Yep, we have, have a new president, and yep, he brings all the kids to the White House. And uh, no, the Secret Service has no sense of humor. If you chase the president around with a 100-pound machine with jaws, they get very upset. <laughs> 2011, we moved the championship to St. Louis. By the way, 30% of the kids building robots, writing code, doing engineering, soldering, welding, are women and minorities. Don't need to point out that the rest of the world loves this kind of stuff. Little South Korea has 500 Lego League teams. Here's some numbers. As of last year, 29,000 schools, nearly a million kids. At least you think I'm making it up. This is what an independent group, Brandeis University, funded by the Ford Foundation, found out when they did a multi-year longitudinal study of the impact of FIRST on kids. You know, this is 9%, 4%, 2.5%. This is nine times. It's 900%, 400%, 250%. Among women, it made a 400% change. Minorities, it doubled. Last year, we had $18 million in scholarships that we handed out at the championship at the end of April in St. Louis. Our president still brings the kids to the White House. And as I said, he announced that he would, in 2012, do our halftime show. And he did it. By the way, as I think most people that know me know, my day job and my nights and weekends blur together. Coca-Cola, besides having a great logistics footprint, Coca-Cola is the largest sponsor of sporting events in the world, like the Olympics. And I went to Mutar and said, as long as you're helping solve this other little problem, like global water, 50% of all human disease, you've got to help us make FIRST louder. He agreed to join the board of FIRST. Paul Jacobs, the chairman and CEO of Qualcomm, the most sophisticated communications capability in the world. They're the backbone of just about every carrier worldwide you know. They are CDMA, without which there'd be no wireless industry. They've agreed to supply us with awesome technology, and their CEO joined our board. Here's first, according to the voice of God. Make it loud. This is the Super Bowl. <clears throat> The Super Bowl of smarts, that is. It's a life-changing competition. It's kids having fun, competing, working together to dream up, design, and build robots. It's just an exhilarating feeling. It's like I'm using power tools. They're having the hardest fun they'll ever have. And they're becoming our next generation of engineers and innovators. First, come out for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. My teachers were some of the greatest influences on my life by challenging and trusting me. These mentors got me to understand that I could do anything I put my mind to. First mentors are changing kids' lives every day. Professional engineers, teachers, parents, teaming up with young people not just to build robots, but to build confidence and self-respect. I'm around people that I can get along with, that we can talk computer lingo with. First was founded by one of our greatest inventors, Dean Kamen. Dean saw that kids mostly look up to sports heroes and movie stars. So we said, if we've got a culture now that's obsessed with sports and entertainment, let's inspire these kids to be big thinkers the same way Shaquille O'Neal can inspire them to spend dozens of hours a week bouncing a ball. Our president agrees. Scientists and engineers ought to stand side by side with athletes and entertainers as role models. And here at the White House, we're going to lead by example. We're going to show young people how cool science can be. Go first! 250,000 kids aged 6 to 18 compete at all different levels. In two first Lego leagues, the first tech challenge. And at the high school level, the first robotics competition. The only difference between this sport and all the others is every kid on our teams can turn pro. 
there's a job out there for every one of these kids. Robot! Students who take part in FIRST are 50% more likely to go to college and twice as likely to major in science or engineering. I definitely know that I want to pursue engineering. Once they've tasted what the power of knowledge is, that it can be fun and rewarding, they won't go back. There's no doubt, first works. 10 or 15 or 20 years from today, some kid in those stands will have cured Alzheimer's or AIDS or cancer or built an engine that doesn't pollute. Look at these kids. They're, they're the future. I feel like I can go and do anything I want to do because of this program. Someone took the time to guide and inspire me. It changed my life. Take some time. Go to usfirst.org. So that's, <clears throat> that's what I showed you. That was two years ago. And last year, as I said, uh, coming back to get the first ever Make It Loud Award, here's Will. That's last year's game. They got points for shooting frisbees and lots of points for climbing the obstacles in the middle of the field by the end of their two-minute rounds. And you see Will with, with his song, yeah, Shady Behind. You can be the greatest, song. you can be the best. You can be the King Kong banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war. You can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. Yeah. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. I see the brightest minds all collected here under the concept of first. The world's gonna know your name. spirit of everybody coming with their costumes and uh, dressing up, uh, it's inviting. It's something that we can duplicate, right? I, I haven't seen anything like it, you know? Yeah, I've been there, I've seen other science fairs, but this is movement. The other one just seemed like science fairs. This seems like a culture. So here's the deal. We can all complain about the problems the world has. The cold hard facts are, of the seven billion people out there, the ones that do most of the complaining, healthcare is too expensive, but we want all we can get. We, the richest people in the world, have lots of privileges. I know we got a Bill of Rights, and we all have all those rights, too. There ought to be a Bill of Responsibilities to go with it. And the people with the resources, the people with the resources, the people that do the most complaining ought to be the ones that are contributing the real solutions. The people that get up every day looking for water that don't have resources, that don't have education, that don't have health, that don't have freedom, they're not going to be the people that can solve these problems. And if the wealthy people in the world want to continue to be distracted by fun and games and using technology either as an amusement or as a weapon, the world's going to keep spiraling in the wrong direction. If the people with technology and people with education, and people that understand media, if, if, if all the stakeholders represented at South by Southwest decided collectively, we have the technology, we have a vision, we have a commitment, we have some courage, this very small group of people, relative to seven billion, really ought to start making some very positive change very quickly. There isn't any other group that can do it. I can tell you one of my favorite quotes of all time, Margaret Mead, 
an anthropologist is the one that said this, which everybody quotes all the time. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. They typically stop there. But the chilling part of that whole quote ends with, indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Big entrenched organizations don't want to change. They like where they are. A few billion people around the world with no resources don't have the possibility to make change. That leaves it to us. IEEE, for instance, the good news is they got hundreds of thousands of people that have capability and resources. That's great, but there are a few hundred thousand people. There are a few hundred million, there are a few billion that need to become part of a successful world. And I think we ought to figure out a way to make that a win-win by changing the way we think about allocation of resources. The world of ideas isn't a zero-sum game. It's not like the old days, well, if they have more oil, we'll have less. If they have more gold, we'll have less. The world of tech is really cool because if you have a great idea and somebody else there has a great idea, you can share the ideas. You each have two great ideas. Technology isn't a zero-sum game. We can be helping the world while we help ourselves. But we need to change the way we think about that. I have, I was supposed to save 15 minutes, we're just about there for questions, but before I ask Ray to come back and help me do that, we have here two teams from the first robotics competition. Come on up. One of them. <laughs> one of these teams, you can see by their number, 2158, team 2100. They've been at it for about eight years. They're a pretty accomplished team. Last, this year's competition requires taking these great big balls and throwing them quite a distance into a goal. There's another team here, Team 5052, the 5,000. They're rookie teams. They've been at it one year. But I think uh, having talked to them, they're pretty excited and jazzed up. They competed last weekend in San Antonio. So, as I said, before Ray comes up and before I forget to point out to all of you that uh, hashtag as Cayman is just a local, I think, for today, but for the rest of the afternoon uh, and the evening, please, I've been asked to invite you to the, to the meetup at 3.30, sponsored by IEEE and First, and then at 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff going on around here, but we've got to make those connections and we've got to make things happen. But for right now, can I ask uh, maybe, again, um, the audience ought to know that by the end of the first week in January, uh, we handed out kits of parts to uh, thousands and thousands of schools. Both of these are from here in Texas and they had to build their robot that had to accomplish a couple of different tasks, one of which was to run around, pick up balls like this, and throw them into a goal. So can you do a, a demo for us? No pressure here. Can you do a demo? By the way, this is an eight-year team, and I, I have to tell you, not to put any pressure on you, but you notice that we've got three guys here, and only one young lady. I'm told that there are seven women on your team. That's the good news. The bad news is that's out of 42. So we got to get that ratio to about 50-50, but you're going to help us, right? You can help us as well. And by the way, while they're booting up, um, you should know that there really are 66 regionals this season. There are probably eight of them this weekend. Uh, including, by the way, we had regional last weekend in Tel Aviv, in Israel. Uh, this coming weekend in Mexico City. We have five regionals in Canada. First, really can become a global network of people that actually do things, create solutions, solve problems. And technology, unlike most other things in different cultures, different religions in different cultures make people maybe not communicate well, different customs. 
But technology is technology. F equals MA everywhere. Technology can bring kids together because it's a common set of values. And if this community would help us grow first around the world, it, I really think, could be like what people have claimed the Olympics would do, bring the world together. But let's not bring the world together to compete and win and lose in amusements. Let's bring the world together to work together in our cooperations to just raise the bar for everybody. Are we running? Oh, no. It's not connecting. There's probably way too much Wi-Fi in this place. I wish we had good technologies. So I am sorry, and, um, but I thank you so much for coming. And uh, maybe uh, throughout the day, I don't know where they're going to be, you'll be able to see this work. But whether you see the machines work or not, talk to the kids. They work. They work really hard. They work together, and they are the future. So with that, I'd like to ask Ray to come back. Is it connected? I'd like to ask Ray to come back, and we can do some question and answer. All right, way to go. So if Thank you come you. to the meetup at 3.30 with Dean, you can come see these robots in action again. So please come and join us at 3.30. And they will. The Wi-Fi connections will work by yes. then. All right. Okay, so uh, we've got some questions. Uh, let's see our first one, Dean. Uh, how do I make sure my inquisitive two-year-old daughter stays curious, especially in subjects like science and technology? This is a layup, isn't it? So you know what? I think all kids are born scientists. Just watch them. They're putting their fingers everywhere. Sometimes it's a place they don't like. They don't do it again. Watch them try to stand up. They fall down. Watch how fast they learn. They're all curious. They're all learning at an incredible pace. That pace, unfortunately, slows down through life. I wish I could learn at the rate of kids. But, and this is nothing against schools. We need the disciplines to learn the math. You got to, you got to, seven times three. You got to know that. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that schools give kids. The problem is that's necessary but not sufficient. I have often said, and I'm not being negative about schools, that kids start out as scientists. They start out as question marks. We send them to school. They come out as periods. They, if you give them nothing but the tools, and you never let them build something, kids aren't going to be excited about having a hammer and a saw. And a, you don't teach them all the rules of football and never let them play. You don't. Life shouldn't be a spectator sport. So you take your two-year-old who's excited and you encourage that excitement. But when they go off to school, when they go off to do other things, whatever you do, you don't try to make people think all the answers are in the back of the book. It's time to be an adult now. It's time to use good... It's, we have a way, I think, of taking curiosity and knocking it out. We teach people how to not make mistakes, how to not fail by following the roadmap of the people that came before us. It's good to learn. It's good to stand on the shoulders of giants. We shouldn't have to relearn everything from the beginning. But kids shouldn't think that all the answers to all the big questions are already done. They're in the back of the book. Then they go out and play some sport because they're excited. Nobody knows who's going to win that game. They need to know nobody knows who's going to win this. There is no right answer to how to build a robot. You've got to take young kids and convince them that the world of science and technology is just plain exciting. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to fail, just like it's okay to try to swing and get a home run and strike out sometimes. You get back up and you start again. So I think it's easy to not let kids lose that sense. I think we have assertively tried to knock it out of them by replacing it with a very rigid set of educational tools. We just want them to take those tools and learn how to get back to the business of being creative. Then they'll realize how important those tools are. They'll redouble their efforts to learn the stuff you learn in school, analysis, but then they'll use it to be creative and do the synthesis. You break down the problem and learn it, and then once you have those tools, you build new things that have never been done before. Okay, so we know FIRST does a great job of inspiring the young people. How about 
adults who have not yet been inspired. What can we do about that? Come to a first event. I'm not kidding. And you'll leave hoarse. You'll leave with your ears ringing. The adults in the stands and the bleachers are as passionate about first as you would be if you were at the Super Bowl or the World Series. A lot of adults, again, particularly women, are intimidated by science and technology. They somehow believe it's not for them. It's hard. Look at all the other skill sets that are. It's pretty hard to get a basketball in that little hoop. But, it, but if you practice and practice and practice, you get better at it. It's okay not to be good. It's okay to make. Somehow we have taken all the places you can hide your ego that we've allowed you to keep in other areas. We've taken them away in the sciences. You get a nephew, you're dumb. I think if the adults in this room and the adults around the world just started to take a deep breath and relax and say, technology's cool and it's fun and I'll play with it. And just like you sometimes strike out, sometimes you smoke that circuit. It's never happened to you guys. But the magic smoke comes out and the circuit doesn't work anymore. You go back and you beg National Instruments to give you some more cool hardware and you try again. I think, I think once adults can feel like it's okay to play with technology the way we play with other things, they'll become part of the first family. That's great. So uh, we just got another question I think is really good. So people hear you talk, they see first, they see a lot of focus on st technology and focus on STEM. So do you think FIRST is putting too much focus on that and should be also showing uh, more emphasis, say, on fine arts or general education or other subjects like that? In the first place, I'd say if there were lots of other things that were out there trying to convince kids that science and engineering and technology are cool, we'd be redundant and maybe, maybe yes. But the fact is there's very, very, very few, if any, organizations I know whose goal is to make science and technology and engineering fun as opposed to teaching it to those that are already, for whatever reason, inspired to do it. So we need to keep focused on breaking all the stereotypes that science and tech are not fun. We have to break down the stereotypes that say it's not for women or minorities. But having said that, even from the beginning, we knew first can't be just some boring esoteric engineering exercise. The teams do everything else that team sports are good about. They learn how to communicate and cooperate. They, they elect their leaders. They go out and do fundraising. They have to design their logos and they have to create... I mean, everything about our sport is like every other sport. And in fact, I think first is a microcosm of the real world. These kids have to learn to communicate and cooperate. They learn how to succeed gracefully and fail gracefully. It's a microcosm of what the rest of their professional lives can be. And every aspect of uh, what you do in the real world, there's a place for in first. And uh, if you look at the awards we give out, most photogenic robots and best team spirit, we do it like all sorts of other sports where everybody from every aspect uh, of a school gets engaged. There's a lot of graphics that they do. One of the big awards is for using some of the advanced graphics. We get software donated by all the big uh, uh, companies like Autodesk and, and, and Parametric Technologies uh, so that kids that like computers or like to do graphics or like to do animation uh, get involved. They help the team design their robots. They help the teams make the stuff. 3D printing is now part of it. Uh, they they create stories about their teams to win the Chairman's Award. So I don't think it's fair to say FIRST is just about technology. At its core, it uses technology to give kids an expanded view of the world. That's great. All right, last question from John Tucker. I like this one. What role do you think government should play in helping FIRST be in every high school? I think the role... This country was founded on the principle, you know, public education was a new concept, really, in America. And I think, just like our government and our taxpayers pay to build schools, and somehow a big piece of those schools, in terms of a percentage of the real estate and cost of operation, 
is that gym with those parquet floors or that football field and the baseball field. And I think it's the role, an appropriate role of government to make all these resources available so kids can have opportunities to do lots of things. I think the departments of education at the local and state level and the government at the, at the national level should find ways to somehow get out of this 19th century model that all the extracurricular stuff should be the fun stuff that doesn't lead to careers because that frankly has more impact on, on a lot of kids than what goes on in the classroom. Knowing that they should say, hey, if we support all of these other after school activities by making them available, they don't run them, but they make them available. We should encourage from the top down and from the bottom up, every school district and from the president down should be saying that just like every school expects, every community expects their kids have access. They're not going to be professional football or basketball players in most cases, but they have access to play these things, to learn these things. We should have a country where every kid, through their school experience, has the opportunity to participate in trying to design and build a robot, to celebrate in our sort of tech festivals at the end of a season, just the way they do in other team sports. And to do it, frankly, you would think it's not that hard, but getting access to their gymnasiums, getting access, giving the teachers that are going to be the coaches of their teams the same kind of stipends that we give the teachers that coach the football or basketball team. Creating the opportunity for first to have an equal share of the hearts and minds of kids as other sports should be something that departments of education and school boards should embrace aggressively because it's only, you know, a whole generation of high school is four years. We don't have a lot of time. We will miss another whole generation of high school kids over the next four years in every school that doesn't have a first team. That's great. All right, well, let's thanks to the kids, the team for participating in first, and their coaches and mentors, and a big round of applause for Dean for joining us here at South by Southwest Interactive. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you.